Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Guillaume Rojat, uh, who is a PhD candidate. And he is uh, working jointly at the Institute for Envi Environmental Sciences, University of Geneva, Switzerland, and at the Faculty of Geoinformation Science and Earth Observation, University of Twente, the Netherlands. So it's a joint appointment. Um, and he's working on his PhD, which is entitled Quantitative Assessment of Future Urban Socioclimatic Vulnerability in a Changing World. So he's been uh, visiting us uh, for about six months now, and he's here for about a year on the fellowship from the National Swiss Science Foundation. So he's been very productive over the last six months, uh, working on socioclimatic and socioeconomic uh, scenarios for Houston, um, and applying a lot of work that he's done for Europe in the American context. And I also should mention that just recently, Guillaume won the best publication award from his university uh, for the paper entitled Influence of Changes on Socioeconomic and Climatic Conditions on Future Heat-Related Health Challenges in Europe. So, welcome, Guillaume. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me well? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's not too loud. Is it fine? Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so thank you very much, um, Olga, for this very kind introduction. So um, today I will talk about um, so basically my PhD, uh, which is really about trying to understand what is the contribution of, of changes in socioeconomic conditions to future climate risk, and that's because climate risks are a function of climate change, but. Uh, also a fun function of uh, changes in socioeconomic conditions. So the, the idea is really to try to, to better understand what is the contribution and what is the role of socioeconomic pathways in shaping future um, climate risk. So the structure of this talk is um, as follows. So I will just first give a bit of a research uh, context of what is risk and what is a scenario and how, how do we actually uh, assess future climate risk. And then I will introduce the, what we call the new scenario framework for climate change uh, research. So it's not really new anymore because it is a couple of uh, years old now. Um, so that's, that's a framework that is made of the climate scenarios, the RCPs, and the socioeconomic scenarios, the SSPs. And then I will, I will show how, how we operationalize and how we applied actually this new scenario framework in two different case, case studies. So the first one is, heat, uh, is population exposure to extreme heat in a number of uh, African cities. And the second case study is, um, is heat-related mortality in uh, Houston. So really trying to apply this new scenario framework and these socioeconomic scenarios at the city scale and at the, even at the intra-city um, scale. And then I will give a bit of conclusions and, and some um, outlook on how can we move uh, forward with this um, scenario framework. So a bit of um, research context. So we, you probably all know that climate risk is function of uh, climate hazards. So it can be heat wave, flooding, hurricanes, drought, wildfires, and others. And it's also a function of uh, socioeconomic exposure. So either the exposure of the population, the exposure of, of the buildings or the infrastructure and also function of vulnerability. So for instance, the vulnerability of populations or communities, it can, can be their age, their uh, education, the income, whether or not they have pre-existing medical con conditions and their, their housings. And so like a, it's really a wide range of uh, dri drivers that really define whether or not a community is, is vulnerable and how vulnerable uh, it is. So we can really see that the Climate risk is really the, the, the function of a climatic component and also a socioeconomic component. So if we want to assess future climate risk, quite logically, we have to look at future climate hazards, right? So we do climate projections. But then we also have to look at future exposure. So for instance, future population projections. And we also have to look at uh, future vulnerability, so the future edge tree structure, the future income, future education, future urbanization. And um, what we found is that until really recently, most of the assessments of future climate risk, they were based only on future climate uh, hazards. So they, they, they really took into account climate projections and they superimposed these projections onto current uh, state of the societies or current vulnerability and current exposure. So that, 
that was until until early uh, 2010. So then in early 2010s, the research community really recognized that we really have to do a better job to, to really to promote and to support the integration of, of future socioeconomic conditions when we look at uh, future vulnerability and, and uh, exposure. So when we look at future climate risk, we, they recognize that we have to take into account future vulnerability and future uh, exposure. But the thing is that we can't use only predictions because just as the, the future greenhouse uh, gases emissions are highly uncertain, it's also highly un uncertain what the future is going to look like, right? Like for instance, the, this small um, coastal town, there is multiple ways in, in which this uh, small com community can uh, look, 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 look like in, in, the, in the future. So we can't work with predictions, so we have to work with scenarios so that we really account for, for the right range of, of plausible features in which a society can uh, actually unfold. So we, can, we have to work with socioeconomic scenarios, and socioeconomic scenarios, they, they, can, be, they can be defined as, as plausible representations of the future that is based on coherent and also internally cons consistent assumptions about drivers of uh, economy and drivers of, of the, the society. So, Excuse me, could I, could I just ask sure. Yeah. Information question. So, when you say, but not only predictions, I'm not sure what part of the problem you're talking about. Are you talking about climate prediction? So here it's more, it's more about socioeconomic predictions, and it, it's a bit also similar as climate predictions. So we, we make a distinction between the prediction and the projection. So the prediction is, in our yeah, language... Why are you using prediction? Yeah, because the, for, for us the prediction is really trying to 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 make like a prediction that is as precise as possible of how the future is going to look like. So really try, trying to to predict uh, uh, as best as we can the future uh, society or the future climate. And when we talk about projections, it's more that we integrate different uh, uncertainties and then we have a wide range of projections. So the prediction in our language is really we want to to be as precise as possible and to really sort of like to foresee the future in really like in a precise way. But if we talk about projections, it's more we really, we really try to, to account for the right range of uncertainty that there is. I don't know if that makes sense. So this is how we, at, at least in, we yeah, <laughs> in our language, that we really make the distinction between the prediction and the projections. So that's uh, how, what I meant by uh, predictions. <laughs> And so, so partly because this uh, new scenario framework was also developed for other aims, but partly it was um, the, the research community developed a new scenario framework so um, that we re replaced the old uh, IPCC stress. And um, this scenario framework was also was partly developed to really to try to to support and to to promote the uh, integration of socioeconomic scenarios when we look at future um, climate risk. So this new scenario framework, as I said, is made of the, uh, the RCP, so the forcing um, level, so that you have on the left side of the matrix. And then it's also made of the SSP, so the shared socioeconomic pathways. And the RCPs and the SSPs, they've been developed in parallel, so that we can use this uh, matrix, and the idea being that one RCP can be reached by different SSPs. So that's really the, the, the basic uh, logic behind this, uh, mat this matrix. There are a couple of inconsistent combinations. For instance, if you look at uh, SSP5, so on the right-hand side there, SSP5 has really high challenges for uh, mitigation. So it's a world where we uh, rely really he heavily on the fossil fuels. So under this world, it's really unlikely that we actually reach uh, RCP 2.6, unless we have like crazy negative emissions, but that's really unlikely. So for instance, the, uh, the, the combination of SSP5 and RCP 2.6 is really unlikely. And similar for, for instance, the combination of SSP1 with RCP 8.5, because SSP1 is a, is a world where we really shift away from the f fossil fuel uh, development, and we really rely a lot on uh, renewable energies. So it's not really likely that we reach um, uh, like a high level of um, climate change. <laughs>
And this uh, new scenario framework was uh, developed and also was uh, applied by two different communities. So the first one is the IAM, so Integrated Assessment Modeling Communities, where they really use these SSPs to, to, to project uh, future energy use and, and supply as well, and land use and future emissions that they use for the, the um, semipsex and policy cost of different mitigation uh, st strategies. And also, uh, it was really useful and really applied by the IAV community, so the Climate Impact Adaptation and Vulnerability Community. And they really use this uh, framework, and especially the SSPs, to explore future uh, vulnerability and future exposure to a wide range of uh, climate risk. And so today, I will really focus only on this use of the framework by the IAV community, um, because I don't know enough about the, the use uh, by the IAM community. Um, so um, the, the SSPs, so for those of you who are not really familiar with, with, with them, so they are really made of global uh, narratives for each of the five uh, SSPs. And they also come with a national scale quantification of these uh, global trends for a couple of key in, uh, indicators, such as the urbanization, the education, the age, and the population, and the GDP. Um, most of this work was done here uh, at uh, NCAR by uh, Brian O'Neill and, and his team. And so the whole idea of this presentation is really to show how we can use this new scenario framework and these uh, SSPs to, to really explore the contribution uh, of socioeconomic pathways in, in shaping uh, future climate risk, and especially at the local scale and in um, urban areas. So the first case study, um, as I said, we're looking at uh, future uh, exposure to extreme heat in a number of uh, African cities. And the main question of this case study was how, how climate change and demographic growth and the combination of the two are going to influence uh, future exposure to population, uh, future ex exposure to extreme heat in a number of uh, urban areas. We wanted to look at the African uh, continent because it's quite uh, understudied, especially uh, with the uh, scenarios. There is not many studies that look at uh, this um, continent. So this is why we, we, we've chosen this uh, case study. So we looked at about 173 different cities, so cities that, are, that have more than 300,000 uh, inhabitants. And so, as I uh, mentioned earlier, so we, we use this new scenario framework, so this uh, matrix. As I said, there, there is a couple of uh, inconsistent combinations, so we didn't use them. For instance, SSP1 with RCP 8.5 or SSP5 with RCP 2.6. But we use uh, all of the other consistent or at least plausible uh, combinations to really explore the full range of uh, plausible f uh, futures. And we also um, made a combination of, of uh, baseline socioeconomic con conditions with climate change and historical climate with uh, changes in uh, in uh, population. The idea being that if with this kind of experiments, we can is isolate the climate effect and the population uh, effect. Some of you might be familiar with the work by uh, Brian Jones, who was here also at NCA before and who's now at uh, CUNY. And that's really basically his, his uh, work. And that's uh, his, his, his uh, I mean, I, I'm using his uh, framework and his way of uh, using that uh, framework. So for the population projections, uh, we realized that when we use the climate projections, we always use really a wide, a wide range of uh, different climate uh, modeling. But we found out that most of the studies that use the SSPs um, to project the socioeconomic con conditions, they always use only one type of uh, model to project the population. So here we wanted to try at least to introduce some uh, uncertainties in the way we project uh, future socioeconomic conditions, and in that, that case, future population. So we use two different approaches. So the first one, we use the spatial approach, where we use the, the, um, the, pop the special population projections that were made by uh, Brian Jones and Brian O'Neill. Um, and these were actually done scaled by Jing Gao, who was here at NCAR before as well, at the one kilometer uh, special scale. And so we use these uh, special projections in combination with some assumptions of how each city is going to grow under each of the SSP. So for instance, here you have uh, Blantyre Limbe in Malawi, and that's the, and the, the boundaries are the different uh, boundaries uh, under the different SSPs for year 2040. 
And so the combination of this spatial extension with the population projections gives us the, the number of uh, urban dwellers for each of the city at uh, each, point of, each point of time for each of the SSP. So that's for the spatial approach. And we also use a non-spatial approach where we, where we combine the national pro pro projections of uh, urbanization under the SSP still, and also national projections of uh, demographic growth. And we made the assumptions that the cities, they follow the national trends, uh, which is a really, really big assumption. And we know that in, in Africa, it's not the case. For instance, the uh, medium-sized cities, they grow much faster than the larger uh, cities. So that's, that's quite a big uh, limitation of this, um, of this approach here. And so that's the results for the population projections that we aggregated in five different uh, regions and for uh, the whole continent. So you can really see that there is one SSP, an SSP that uh, depicts a high increase in uh, inequalities and uh, high, like the education is not really increasing as well, and uh, the fertility is not de decreasing. So it's really, it's really a world that is highly urbanized and that is highly uh, populated. So SSP4 here, you can really see that it. it it leads to a really tremendous growth in the number of urban dwellers compared to the other uh, SSPs. Interestingly, we can al also see that, for instance, the number of uh, mega cities, so those are the cities that have more than 5 million uh, inhabitants, it grows from almost like, like le less than 5 currently to more than 40 under all of the scenarios. So we can really see that in, in most of the scenarios, uh, there is really a, a large increase in population growth in urban areas of, of uh, Africa. And that's going to have obviously a great impact on future exposure in these uh, cities. Then for the heat hazard projections, so we use 22 different combinations of DCMs and RCMs from the Africa Codex project. Um, our heat index was uh, the number of days per year when the apparent temperature, so that's a combination of the, the, the temperature and the relative uh, humidity, was above 105 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So that's uh, the threshold of dangerous heat from the National uh, Weather Service here in, in the US. And um, we, can, we can see two different situations. We can see, for instance, that in, in uh, Western Africa, Climate change is going to strengthen to reinforce uh, existing extreme heat, but in other areas such, such as Eastern Africa or Central Africa, there is actually a an, an, uh, new heat that, that is an extreme heat that is emerging. So we can see uh, in here that plot shows the cities where currently they don't have uh, extreme heat, they don't suffer from extreme heat. But uh, so we have about 60 cities currently, and then by the end of the century, uh, we have less than 35 cities that don't experience extreme heat. So those cities that really will really experience a new extreme heat in the coming uh, decades, that is also going to have an, an influence on the future exposure. So talking about exposure, so that's the, again, that's the matrix with the different climate scenarios and the different socioeconomic scenarios. And the nice thing with this uh, matrix is that if we go along a row like this, we can really see the influence of different SSPs, so of different types of urbanization and de demographic growth under given climatic con conditions. So here under RCP 4.5, we can really see the effect of different socioeconomic scenarios. So we can see that under SSP 4, for instance, toward the end of the century, the um, population exposure is much higher than um, under the other uh, SSPs. And if we go along a colon, then we can really see, for a given socioeconomic con conditions, we can see the influence of different types of climate change. So if we go along a row, we can really guess that there is a significant uh, influence of uh, population growth on future, um, future uh, exposure to risk. So that's uh, here we, we um, chosen five different combinations of SSPs and RCPs. And what's, so that, that's for the different uh, areas and for a couple of selected uh, cities. And for instance, we can see in Yamei or even in Dar es Salaam, um, if, we, if we are in a world where we are under SSP4 and RCP 8.5, we are at almost 10 billion per day. But then if we shift towards SSP5, and still under RCP 8.5, the, the exposure is much, it's much, much uh, lower. It's, it's around uh, 3 uh, billion person day. So we can really see that this shift here, this influence is only the influence of uh, socioeconomic scenarios. It's only the influence of a reduction in, in uh, population growth. 
So based on that, we can, um, as I said, we can compute the population effect or the climate effect. So the population effect is the, is the exposure that um, is, the ex is when we, we compute the exposure based on historical climatic con conditions, and the climate effect is when we compute exposure based on uh, historical socioeconomic conditions. And we can see that in most of the re regions, except Southern Africa, it's actually the population effect that uh, drives uh, exposure, as well as the interaction effect. So the interaction effect is places where we are both, there is a new hit and also population growth at the same time, so the interaction of the two um, is, is this uh, interaction uh, effect. And interestingly, we can see that in some cities, for instance in Yamei, in Niger, that the population effect is, is, is extremely high, and that's, it's because it's a city that has already pretty high extreme heat, and the changes in socioeconomic conditions are much larger than the ch changes in climatic conditions. So the population effect is really high. And if we look at Dar es Salaam, the interaction effect is extremely high, and that's because it's a city that is currently doesn't experience extreme heat, but then in the future, the combination of new extreme heat and really high population growth, that together creates a really high interaction effect. So. That, that's why we can see here uh, uh, interaction effect that is really high. And then um, what we can do also with this matrix is that we can compute what we call the shifting potential. So that's basically the difference in exposure when we shift from one SSP to another or from one RCP to uh, another. For, for instance, on the top row here, when we shift from SSP5 to SSP4, under RCP 8.5, the difference in exposure is about 170 um, billion person day. And we can do the same when we shift under, for instance, our RCP 4.5 to RCP 8.5 under a given SSP, then we have also the, the shifting potential of the RCP. And what we can see from this figure is that the shifting potential of the SSP is, is, is as big as the shifting potential of the RCP. So that really tells us that the, the role of the, SS, of the SSP, so of the socioeconomic scenarios, in shaping future exposure here is really important. And what we can do, we can focus on the shifts that actually lead to avoided uh, exposure, so to, uh, to, to like a reduction in uh, exposure. And then when we compare the uh, avoided exposure in relative terms, from, from, for instance, if you look at Africa uh, towards the end of the, uh, the century, in blue here we have a shift from a high R uh, RCP to a low one, so RCP 8.5 to RCP 2.6, and in brown we have uh, from a high SSP to a, no, that's the other way around, sorry, and in brown that's uh, the shift from high R RCP to low RCP, and in blue that's a shift from a high SSP to a low SSP. And we can see that the shift from a high SSP to a low SSP leads to slightly more um, avoided ex exposure than a shift from a high RCP to high SSP, uh, high RCP to low RCP. And that's, that's pretty new in a sense that most of the studies that have used similar, similar approach, they, most of them found that the, the, um, the climate effects so or the shift in uh, RCP was more influential than a shift in uh, SSP. But in the case of African cities, it's, uh, it's the, the other way around. And that's mainly because uh, African cities are the places in the world where population growth is pretty much the highest. So the, so the, so the population effect, so the influence of the, the demographic growth is really is, is extremely high in, in these uh, areas. So this, this is why we, we, we see a very high effect of the, of the population compared to the effect of uh, climate. So some challenges that were, uh, that were associated with this uh, study is that in Africa, we don't have any record of uh, mortality due to heat. So for instance, that's the study by uh, Gasparini, where, where the, that's pretty much the state of the, state of, of the heart in terms of uh, 
mortality related um, no, heat related mortality and we can see that all of the data that they, they collected there is no uh, single data set in in, uh, in Africa so if we don't have records on mortality we, we can't even draw some temperature mortality relationships and we don't we, we, we can't even also look, look look at what are the drivers of uh, vulnerability that leads to more or less mortality so it's really tricky in this kind of that, that data scarce and environments to go further than just the population exposure. It's already cool to, to see the population exposure, but I think it would be also much more interesting to look at vulnerability in this kind of place and, and uh, mortality. But so far, we, we can't really do this. And also, um, we really lack of data and understanding as well to account for the urban heat uh, island under the different SSPs. And obviously, uh, this really high growth in the cities are going to influence also the local climate. So it should be really, really cool and really interesting to look at how different SSPs are actually going to influence the local climate of each of the uh, cities. So that's also maybe something for uh, further research. So that's for the African uh, case studies. And now we're going to move on the case study in uh, Houston. So um, what's cool in Houston is that we have plenty of data sets and thanks to a similar project that uh, Olga led, uh, we, we, had, uh, we had a very good understanding of what are the drivers of uh, vulnerability there and what, what is the relationship between temperature, uh, mortality and vulnerability. So the main goal of uh, the study here is really to, to provide specially explicit uh, estimates of future heat related mortality in Houston taking into account all of the uncertainties, so take, taking different combinations of climate and socioeconomic scenarios, and then use also the scenario framework to, to, to try to determine which are or which is the main driver of uh, mortality in, uh, in Houston, of future mortality. So is it climate change? Is it the increase in vulnerability? Or is it the increase in population or the urbanization? So thanks to the scenario uh, framework, we can actually answer these uh, questions. So the modeling framework for this study is a bit different than for the African studies, and it's a bit more complex. So um, first of all, we start with a model of heat-related mortality. So that was developed by uh, Matt Heaton here at uh, NCAR, also within the CIMER project. So it tells us a relationship between the daily minimum term temperature and drivers of vulnerability and population. So the drivers of vulnerability are the, the social isolation, the race and ethnicity, and the prevalence of AC, the age, or the, the elderly and the young, and the poverty. And then because we want to look now at future projections <laughs> using the scenario uh, matrix, so we have to take into account climate scenarios, so we use the RCP. And we use also the, the um, uh, North American uh, codex, uh, the, the simulations that were, were made within this, um, this project. And we couple them with, um, with um, urban climate uh, models, so ALDAS. And then for the socioeconomic side, that's slightly more complicated because we have the global SSPs, but the global SSPs, the global socioeconomic development trends. So they don't really tell us what's going to happen in Boulder or in Houston. So we have to, to call what we have to extend them. So it's, we have to contextualize them for a specific sector or specific region. So in our case, we have to contextualize them for Houston. So to do this, we, um, we employed the, we, we employ the existing literature on the historical trends and also development plans of uh, Houston, and we al also had a consultative uh, pr process with stakeholders at the local scale to really to, to refine the scenarios and to have a better I idea of what the global SSPs mean for this specific uh, city. And then um, another tricky part of this uh, study was actually to project these drivers of vulnerability. Uh, at the census tract scale uh, under the different SSPs. And the idea also when we do this projection is very important to ensure that the consistency with the national and the, the, the global scale, so the, the global SSP quantification has also to be consistent with our local uh, quantification. So to, to, to do this, we, we also employ the national pro projections under the different S SSPs as sort of boundary con conditions for our uh, local uh, projections. And um, as I mentioned 
before also, um, it should be very interesting to look at how different SSPs actually influence the local climatic con conditions. So we also pro projected future land use under the different SSPs, and then these uh, SSP projections of uh, land use were fed in, in, into the urban climate model there to really try to see how different types of socioeconomic de de development are going to in in influence the uh, local uh, climatic conditions, in, and in our case, the local daily minimum temperature. So based on this framework, we could also conduct an, a number of experiments to try to isolate these uh, different contributors of um, mortality. So we did experiments when we uh, look only at future climate, so that's the climate effect, when we look only at future vulnerability, so that's the, the vulnerability effect, and you do the same for the population and the urbanization. And we also look at different combinations, and at the end we also obviously look at the integrated assessments when we, we look at the projections for all of the uh, drivers of mortality. So the first uh, results for vulnerability, uh, that's only for a couple of uh, drivers of, of vulnerability here. Um, you can see that there are some differences between the, the, the SSPs, al although there are some like also trends that are very similar. For instance, the, the number of households that don't have AC, it's de decreasing under all of the scenarios because all of the new building buildings have uh, AC now. And um, the poverty, it's de decreasing under certain scenarios, but under uh, some of the other scenarios, it's still pretty high. So we can also see when we look at the greater Houston here, we can see that for, um, that's for the population and the poverty, there are some significant di difference be between the different uh, scenarios. So that's going to have an influence, obviously, on future uh, mortality. And then when we look at uh, land use and climate change, so first the land use, um, we had pretty different uh, ass assumptions under the different SSPs in terms of how the city is going to, to grow and how the city is going to expand. So for instance, under SSP1, we assume a very compact and a very dense city. So you, you can see that the, the, the sprawl is not that high, so that's the urban fraction here. And for instance, under SSP5, we, as we assume a very sprawling uh, city, sorry, so you can really see that the city is really expanding in all of the currently rural areas. And, that's, and you can also see in the terms of the composition of the, uh, of the city that under this scenario it's a lot of uh, low uh, density urban areas and under the, this same scenario we have a lot of high density urban um, areas. So that's going to have an, obviously an uh, impact on the urban heat uh, island. So here we have uh, the current situation for the daily minimum temperature, and if we go if we go along the road there, we have the on, the, the sole influence of uh, changes in uh, urbanization. So you can see that under SSP one, the urban heat uh, island is it's, it's quite lower than under, for instance, SSP five, where we assume a very sprawling city. But but if we go along the column, and we, we, so that's RCP four four point five and RCP eight point five, we can really 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 see that. Cli climate change has a much bigger influence on the local temperature than the urban heat uh, island. But still, the, under SSP5, it still has a quite significant influence on the lo local temperature. And here, that's the, that's the difference in temperature that is due only to urbanization. And you can see that under SSP5, there are some areas, especially around the city, where the urban heat island is actually expanding. And so the, these are areas that are much warmer due, due to the uh, UHI. So then what we do is that we combine this, uh, the, this uh, climate projections with the projection of vulnerability and population into the heat-related uh, mortality model. And that gives us the mortality projections. So if we were to look only at climate change, like we were doing a couple of years ago, we would say that um, the, the excess in mortality is, is, is about 200 uh, persons here. But then if we are to integrate ch changes in vulnerability and ch changes in population, the uh, excess in, in mortality is more about 15 to 25,000 uh, persons. I have to say here that we look at non-accidental mortality during summer. So that's so that, that's why the, this, these numbers are pretty big, because it's not only heat-related mortality, it, it's non-accidental mortality that happens during the summer. So that is supposedly, supposedly linked to the heat, but that, that's not only heat-related uh, 
mortality. So this is why these are pretty pretty huge uh, numbers. So we can really see that the changes in socioeconomic conditions, so the changes in vulnerability and in population, leads to approximately 60 times more excess in mortality than changes in climatic conditions. So we could even say that the the the, the climate change in that, that case is almost non-significant. Uh, and when we look at the dominant effects, so we want to know whether it's the climate effect, the interaction, population, urbanization, or vulnerability effect, that is the dominant effect. When we look at the county scale or at the city scale, it's only the vulnerability and the population and the interaction of the, these two effects that uh, drive uh, future mortality. And when we look at um, at a census tract scale, that's the, also the same uh, result. It means that in all of the census tracts, in all of the scenarios also, the dominant effect is either the vulnerability, the uh, population, or the interaction of the two. And in none of the census tracts, it's actually the climate or the urbanization that has the, uh, the dominant effect. So that really tells us that when we look at vulnerability and when we look at mortality in uh, Houston, it really changes in vulnerability, changes in socioeconomic conditions that have the highest and the dominant effect on future mortality. So that's what I just said. <laughs> and um, as a conclusion, this, this sort of throughout these two different examples, we, we, we've showed that uh, this framework first is very useful to support and to mainstream the integration of socioeconomic scenarios when we look at future climate risk. And um, we've showed that with these two examples that socioeconomic, uh, that future socioeconomic conditions are really going to have a great influence of future cl cl climate risk. So it's really important to integrate these scenarios. And then um, what's really useful also with this uh, scenario matrix is that we can, we can explore really a mu multiple range of future because we have different combinations of climatic and socioeconomic conditions. And also it's very use useful to, to disentangle and to, to really explore individually the, con the, con the contribution of each of the effects of uh, future climate risks. So the population, the climate vulnerability, urbanization, and, and climate. And um, finally, um, we also have to be a bit careful with the findings here because that, that really applies only for Houston and only for the heat-related uh, mortality model that we have. Uh, we know that this model gives a pretty important way to the socioeconomic part and a pretty low way to the, um, to the climatic part. So that's also, that also might explain why the uh, changes in so socioeconomic conditions have so much uh, influence compared to the changes in uh, climatic conditions. So we really have to apply this uh, framework to a lot of different case, case studies and a lot of the different mortality models to really have a better, uh, a better idea of really how, the, how much the changes in socioeconomic conditions contribute to future climate risk in, in urban areas. So a few, a few outlooks. So first of all, the policy implications of this kind of study can be a bit tricky. For instance, when you look only at climate change, it's, it's, it's often pretty easy because and pretty straightforward because we just have to basically say that we have to, to reduce the emissions so that it uh, reduces risk. But for um, the socioeconomic component, it can be a bit more uh, tricky. That's, for instance, a quote from one of the uh, reviewers of the the paper on the African uh, city, and he asked, are the authors suggesting that we should develop policies to increase mortality rates, right? Because then it, uh, it decreases uh, exposure. Sure. But, you know, so we really have to, I think, to be really careful when we, uh, when, when, when we have this kind of study, because mainstreaming uh, population policies, either in the adaptation or the, in the mitigation strategies, that can be quite uh, controversial. And also, for the study on uh, Houston, we found that SSP5, so it's a, a scenario that is heavily based on uh, fossil fuel development, or really a lack of environmental concerns. And that's the scenario that leads to the lowest mortalities, because it's, in, it's, a, it's a scenario where uh, we have a cheap access to AC, we have a de de decrease in, in, in inequalities, and we have a high immigration from the Hispanic community that lowers the, the, the aging, so it lowers the vulnerability. So with this kind of finding, we also have to be a bit, you know, a bit careful on how we communicate this kind of uh, findings to the local st stakeholders. <laughs>
And then to finish um, some, some opportunities, one of the main ideas also of this framework and of using these frameworks in a number of different case studies is that if we, if we always use the same SSPs, then we have a sort of like a common ground. So we can pretty much do a meta-analysis of all of the studies that use the SSPs to assess future climate risk in different settings for different risk in different regions. And then we can really aggregate all of these study together. So for instance, so, so far we've collected more than 100 different studies that use the RCP and the SSPs. And the, the idea is really to, to combine them and then to, to draw a much broader picture of what what is the influence of different socioeconomic pathways? We, we really look, looking at, at, at a broader scale with all of the uh, individual case, case studies. So that's really one of the added value of you you're using a common framework with a common scenarios is that we can merge and gather the, 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 the results in a sort of uh, meta-analysis afterwards. And then um, the scenario matrix can also be used to assess the efficiency of the adaptation options. So that's when we add here a third, um, a third um, ah, how do you call it, axis to the uh, matrix. And we can have different, as, as we have the, the different socioeconomic scenarios, we can have different scenarios of adaptation. And we can really see how these different scenarios of adaptation actually play out under different com combinations of socioeconomic and climatic con conditions. So that's something that we started to see re recently in the literature, but there is not many uh, study that look at this uh, adaptation under the different SSPs. And uh, finally, uh, when, so when we did the review of these uh, in existing studies, we found that some, some fields are a bit left uh, unstudied. So for instance, uh, the climate induced migration or the conflicts or the air pollution or all the vector borne uh, diseases. There has been a very great study by uh, Andy Monaghan here, who, who looked at the, um, the future exposure under the different SSPs and uh, different climate scenarios, the future exposure to uh, IDIS uh, Aegypti. But since this study, there has been no other studies that have looked at the SSPs uh, at the influence of the SSPs on the ve vector borne diseases. And that's pretty much the same for air pollution also. There is only a couple of studies out there. And so I think that for these two uh, climate risks, um, there might be very interesting uh, research to, to do and perhaps some collaboration as well uh, here within uh, NCAR. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, just feel free. Thank you. Thanks, that was a fire hose of information. That was a really nice talk. Uh, has anyone looked at, I, in my view, one of the other important questions is heat-related morbidity. And you know things like heat stroke and other things which may affect a larger um, range of age groups and people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, have there been any studies to look at that, or is there any way to look at that in this context, um, which might show, um, I, I would assume, and probably incorrectly, but assume that maybe climate would have a bigger impact in those cases because you just have a larger, presumably a much larger um, caseload under mm -hmm. morbidity. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I haven't read any studies that look at morbidity under the different socioeconomic scenarios, but I think that's definitely a topic of, of really high interest. And as soon as we have a current understanding of the relationship between the different drivers of vulnerability, heat, and more morbidity, then we basically we just have to project heat and the vulnerability, and then can see how the influence on future morbidity. So I think if we, if we have a current understanding of this uh, different drivers, and I guess we have, at least for some case studies, then it's, it's pretty easy, let's say, to, to apply the scenario framework to project this. And I fully agree that in that case, probably the climate impact will be much bigger than in the, the in case of the mortality. Yeah. 
and, and, and I think it should be really interesting, you know, to really expand this new scenario framework to all of these different case, case studies so that we really have a better understanding of the relative contribution of clim climate change from one side and changes in socioeconomic conditions from the other side. Yeah. I think so. It's a really interesting talk. Um, if you could go back to the slide in for the Houston study where you're looking at the um, changes in, in mortality with the mats, I, yeah, I think I think that, that no. yeah, I think that was it. Okay. Um, I was kind of struck by the the enormous increase in in mortality under each of the the SSP. Um, uh, Me too. E experiments <laughs> there. So I'm I'm wondering to what to what extent is that huge increase just from population increase versus if you were to look at it in a per capita framework, mm -hmm. how, how different would this look? Yeah, exactly. So what you can see here, for instance, is the contribution of um, excess in mortalities at the greater Houston scale. So it's green, it's only due to changes in, in vulnerability. So you can see that about, about 12 thousands of the excess in mortalities is only due to vulnerability. And then about, about uh, 4 thousand it's due only to, to changes in population. And then the rest is the interaction of the two. So you can really see that. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking only for the, the first uh, com combinations here on the left side. So you can really, really, really see that at, at least at, uh, at the, the greater Houston scale, it's really changes in vulnerability that have more influence than changes in population. And for instance, then here you have, and for each of the census tract, you, you can also see what is the dominant uh, effect. So for instance, if you look on the far uh, right, right side, it's SSP5. So the vulnerability is pretty low in this scenario, but the population growth is really high. And so you, you can see that for lots of the census tract, the dominant effect is actually population and it's not vulnerability. But at the greater Houston scale, mo at least a Two, two thirds of the excess in mortality is due to changes in vulnerability only, which is very surprising, I know, but that's mainly also because of the aging that is really, it's really tre 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 tremendous in uh, Houston and the heat related mortality model that we have gives also a very, very high weight to uh, aging, around three to 10 times more than all of the other dr dr drivers of vulnerability. So that's also why. Yeah, thanks. Very interesting. Um, I wanted to understand a little bit more completely the way in which you develop the climate scenarios and to what degree you actually completely sampled the uncertainty space of the climate. So you said that you used NA Cortex. So I'm mm -hmm. interested in, you know, which of those simulations you used, at what resolution, and how did you develop the ones for the RCPs that aren't really very well represented or not represented at all in mm -hmm. NA Cortex. Yeah, so we, we actually use only two different RCPs, so 4.5 and 8.5 for this study on the Houston. And so for 4.5, we have only six different combinations of GCM and uh, RCM. And for uh, 8.5, we have 15, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 15. Um, and we used uh, only daily minimum temperature from these uh, simulations. And we don't link them di di directly to uh, ALDA. So the idea is that we compute a sort of um, like a delta between the, hist the, the historical conditions and the future one. And then we, we apply this uh, delta to the ALDAS uh, simulations. So I, I don't know if I'm you- Sorry, I don't quite understand. ALDAS, what? Uh, the, the, the urban climate uh, model, because we, we, we simulate first the urban climate, uh, the, the urban cl climate with the urban climate model, with, with, without assumptions of uh, climate change. And then we use the um, Cordex projections to compute the delta for Houston of the, between the, the current and the future under the two uh, RCP, and we apply this delta to, uh, to the urban climate uh, simulations. And okay, so the so the RDAS model takes in only 
the current climate, minimum, the, the minimum temperature. Um, but yeah, and me, you can. <laughs> uh, the model, uh, yeah, the model. So, so what we did was downscaled. Um, uh, Guillaume gave me five, the five land use projections, and then we had a historical land use data set as well. So we ran six simulations with the offline version of the NOAA land surface model, which is called HurlDAS. Um, and so you're forcing it with um, the lowest layer of an atmospheric model, the temperature, humidity, radiation, all the things you would need to drive, like same things you need to drive CLM. <clears throat> um, and you're, um, you're solving for the energy balance. So you're essentially what you're doing is um, these simulations we forced with a data set called NLDAS, which is a one eighth degree uh, atmospheric data set over the US that's used to force a lot of land surface models. But what you're essentially doing, it's kind of a, a poor man's way of downscaling to high resolution, um, a little bit lower resolution data set using the information you get at fine resolution from the land surface uh, parameters. So you have, so we had one kilometer land use data and we downscaled to that. Um, uh, we downscaled a, a, a lower resolution atmospheric data set to one kilometer using land use data and then backing out what the near surface temperature and humidity would be from that. So, so we had done that in the original HurlDAS or the original Simmer uh, project um, that was in collaboration with Matt Heaton. And then we gave Matt about, I don't know, 10 or 15 different potential explanatory variables out of that. From that, he developed a model of heat-related mortality, and the um, the leading predictor in that was minimum temperature, and so his model needs minimum temperature. So one of so we just used that particular output from the model, and then um, Steve Sane and Amy Marsha developed a way to take that uh, a statistical kind of an ensemble statistical technique uh, to take. Um, I think it's just a time series from a future climate projection and um, downscale that to that one kilometer grid over the city for the present. So take the present day one kilometer meteorological data at the minimum temperature and you have a future minimum temperature time series and then they have a way of, you know, basically an algorithm that downscales that. So it's not a, um, you know, it's a, it's a, um, a statistical downscaling technique with a little bit of dynamical um, realism in it through the land surface model. Um, okay, I don't want to take up all this time, but I kind of lost where the NA Cortex simulations fit into all of this. You take that time series, yeah, that's a good question. So you take a future time series from each, you take the time series of minimum temperature over Houston for any for any of those ensembles of simulations and downscale it onto the six historical um, simulations for use in each with a different land use scenario. So so we ran six historical simulations, but each with a different land use scenario based on which SSP we were looking at. And then those were downscaled um, using the, the time series uh, with a statistical technique. Okay, um, well, we can talk more about that later. I just want to say you might be interested that we've done experiments. Um, so I'm the co-chair of NA Cortex. Um, and we've just done experiments actually doing the land cover changes for both SSP5 and SSP3 over uh, all of the US at about 12 kilometers. So. Um, that could be interesting because then, of course, the urban heat island effect is part of the initial dynamical simulation, and so you get a, mm -hmm. well, minimally a simpler way of, of representing that. So you can talk about that later. Sure, yeah. That sounds but very interesting. interesting. Thank you. So, so I'll echo the other commenters that um, I, I found this fascinating. It was a great talk. Uh, and I was going to editorialize a little bit on something, but I'll, I'll forgo that. Um, the question I have for you is, 
some some of your results i said okay intuitively that makes sense but some of them i found a little surprising so so as you were working through this what surprised you <laughs> okay, well, it's a, <laughs> it's a pretty large uh, question. So I, I, I was really surprised by, by the influence of changes in vulnerability for the Houston case studies and how almost uh, insignificant are the changes in climatic conditions. But then when I, when, when I try to understand a bit deeper the heat-related mortality model, then I really found out that in this model, the changes in climatic con con conditions don't have a very, a very important weight compared to the changes in, in, in vulnerability. And also, uh, changes in vulnerability, they take the, the, uh, the, the, the weight of uh, aging is, is really in, important in that uh, model. And aging is one of the drivers of vulnerability that changes the most. So basically, uh, aging is also responsible for most of, the, um, of these uh, changes in, in, in uh, the excess of uh, mortalities. And what's a bit not annoying, but with this kind of approach is that we used um, current relationships be between heat and, and mortality and drivers of, of vulnerability. So for instance, we say that an increase in 1% of uh, the, the percentage of uh, elderly in a given census tract is going to increase mortality by 5.6%. So that's for, for the, the current, uh, you know, because Matt, he, he used the data set from the 10 years ago. But in, in 2050, it might be that this relationship in, in between the increase in elderly and the increase in, in mortality is completely different. So that, 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 that's also one of the main limitations of this kind of approach is that we predict assuming the his, historical relationships between these drivers. And it might be that in 2050, uh, ch changes in 1% of elderly is only going to increase mortality by 0.5%. We, we don't know, know that. So it might be also that uh, these relationships changes in the, in, in the future. So we really have to be very um, cautious with, this, with the findings that we have here, I guess. OK, we'll take one more question. Claudia, did, did you hear? I'm really focusing on the climate side of this. And it seems to me that in both case studies, you're looking at places where uh, both current temperature and projected temperature is going to change less than other places, for example, in the high latitudes. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, but then, of course, in the high latitude, you know, uh, vulnerability is less because it, they are usually richer places and more developed. So it's, it's kind of a, yeah. a catch-22 here where to, to see something really interesting coming out, you should find a place where both climate changes a lot mm -hmm. and then population and vulnerabilities change a lot across the SSPs and I cannot really think of one. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe maybe <laughs> the problem is, or the problem, you know, the issues that we're always looking at heat, 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 heat. And, I'm, and uh, so I was trying to think what is the other climate hazard mm -hmm. that may change a lot in places like the global south, you know? Is it floods? Is it, I don't know, it's definitely not snow. <laughs> but um, so I, I'm just, uh, putting that out there that maybe, you know, it would be interesting to think of an application where both climate and um, population or socioeconomic drivers change a lot. That's true, yeah. And we, we had a couple of uh, studies, so in the meta analysis that we are doing, there are also studies in the, the, the global source and where, where they look at droughts. And we can, and we, and they also account for vulnerability, and there they, they really find that changes in climatic con conditions really outweigh and really are m m much more important than the changes in vulnerability, because the magnitude of change in, in drought is much broader than the magnitude of change in, in, in vulnerability. Yeah, so I guess it really depends ca case by case, and that, that's why I, I think it's also quite important to to do like a meta-analysis of all of the studies I've done there to really give a broader understanding of what is the real contribution of changes in socioeconomic conditions to future climate risk. Because obviously, it's not going to be as extreme as in the Houston case study, I, I can imagine. So yeah, that's a very, very good point, yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting and kind of sad to think of what happened at NCA. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
All right. Well, I think we um, at three o'clock. So let's uh, thank Guillaume again for excellent presentation, and thanks everyone for questions. <laughs>